We can open up to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And I want to talk to you today with uh, actually what is in line with the songs we sang and the prophetic words and prayers we heard. Uh, and that is this, living unshaken in a shaky world. Living unshaken in a shaky world. And to do that, I want to read uh, several verses from uh, Romans chapter 8, and then uh, before I, I get to our, our key verse. So uh, if you'll look at uh, Romans chapter 8, let's just hear uh, the word of God. Uh, first of all, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then skip down to verse 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Skip down to verse 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. And then the main text we're going to be looking at, uh, verses 28 through 39, familiar verses. Verse 28, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of the God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No! In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life neither angels nor rulers, neither things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, Philip Melanchthon was one of the great uh, reformers of the day. He was often known as Martin Luther's scholar. Luther's scholar. And on his deathbed, uh, Melanchthon requested that the passage that we read today, Romans chapter 8, be read to him. And when his friend who was reading to him got to verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? He asked that it be read again. And as it was read again, he simply murmured this, that's it. That's it. And he soon died, therefore, with great confidence. He died secure that because God was with him, because God was for him, not even death could be against him. 
Not only did he die securely, but he lived securely uh, in, in incredibly turbulent and threatening times uh, because of uh, the great truths of this passage. And I, for one, just praise God for the example of men like Philip Melanchthon uh, because the reality of it is most of us struggle at times at least, perhaps more than we like to admit, with living unshaken in a shaky world. John Stott said, insecurity is written all across human experience. Insecurity or shakiness is, is written all across human experience. And the reason this passage is, is so critical is because if, if you aren't, if we aren't secure in God's acceptance and love, the acceptance and love that this passage, I think above any in all of Scripture speaks to, if we aren't secure, we're going to experience all too common problems that result from that insecurity. Uh, things like living in fear. Uh, fear not is the most common uh, biblical command uh, because it is so common to human experience. Things like fear. Things like anxiety. Things like worry. Things like discouragement. Things like e even so much as, as depression. Uh, things like doubt. Uh, those, those will be the common human experiences uh, of living in a shaky world. That the shaky world becomes the dominant reality of our lives instead of the unshakability of God himself and our relationship uh, with God. So we saw in verse 28... All things work together for good, as their New American Standard says even better. God causes all things to work together for good. And then in verses 29 through 30, God has, has laid out this unbreakable chain of, of salvation for us, foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justified, glorified, with, with no breaks. D did you notice he said, and those whom he, he also... Uh, there, there, there isn't anyone whom he foreknew that he didn't also predestine and call and justify and glorify. The, train is, uh, is, the chain is unbroken. But do you, do you recognize along? Don't human beings have an, an incredible capacity to say what if? Don't, don't we have an incredible capacity to say what if? To, to read the assurances of a passage like this, to read that unbroken chain, but then think to ourselves, yeah, but wait a minute, wh what if this is the case? And I think the passage that we read here deals dramatically and finally with all of those what ifs that we can imagine in life that cause us to at times be so shaken. And basically what the passage says is this, that our security in this life and in the life to come is grounded in the love of God for us. The love of God that is conspicuously demonstrated for us in the gospel itself. Now, there could be a lot of ways to break down this passage, but what I want to do is, is this. I simply want to look at one question that's being asked and then two answers that Paul gives to us. But before we do that, uh, let's pray together. Father, uh, I, I thank you uh, that everything we need for life and godliness is given to us in and through your word. And uh, this passage and the, the hope and the grounding and the security and the, and the surety uh, that it gives us, oh, Father, it... It, it, it helps us to live in a world that, that is, because of sin, um, is, is, is shaky and can sometimes shake us as we live in this and walk through this fallen world with other fallen people. So I pray today, Father, that no matter where we are, um, for those who, who even today have come struggling with, 
with trials and are shaken and are worried and are anxious and are depressed and are, uh, are, are, are struggling with doubts, I pray, Holy Spirit, you would minister to their hearts, uh, that you would, you would encourage and strengthen, you, you, you would put iron in their souls as a result of these things. And for all the rest of us, Father, none of us escape life without at times having things happen that will shake us. And I pray that you would, uh, again, prepare us for those future things and remind us of the great truths of this passage. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said, one question, uh, two answers. And the one question is in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, and that is this. What shall we say to these things? And the these things that Paul is referencing are uh, everything that he has said so far in Romans chapter 8. So the fact that because of, of what Jesus has done for us, there is now no condemnation. Uh, not just the feeling of condemnation, but no actual condemnation. And uh, then the reality uh, that there is going to be sufferings in this present world, but they're not worthy to compare with the glories that we're going to experience in the life to come. The reality that, that all of creation is groaning under the weight of, of fallenness and that as Christians, even we groan uh, as we await that day when Jesus will return and uh, our bodies will be redeemed and there'll be no more crying or tears or pain uh, or suffering in this life. So when, when Paul asks, what shall we say to these things? These are the things that he's referring back to. He's referring back to the fact that, that uh, uh, God causes all things to work for our good. He's referring to this unbroken chain of God foreknowing us before the foundations of the world to, to finally bringing us to glory. Um, and, and that chain is, is, is never broken. And so uh, he does this brilliantly simply by asking this big question, but then following that with, with questions that he then answers for it. And uh, he gives basically two answers to this question. What then shall we say to these things? He gives us a judicial answer, and he gives us a relational answer. So first, let's look at the judicial answer. And actually, his judicial answer in two parts. So part one, we find here in verses 31 and 32. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Uh, Paul is really throwing down a gauntlet for us here. Uh, he's challenging us. He's daring anyone to step up uh, and, and, and refute what he is saying here. And basically he's saying, Nothing can be said in it to refute uh, this reality uh, that if God is for us, nothing or no one can be against it. Now, again, because of our, our unique ability as human beings to have what ifs, we can read that if God is for us is as, well, is he for us? I don't know if he's for us. Maybe he's for us. Sometimes he's for us. Listen, th this isn't an if of doubt. It's an if of certainty. Uh, the, the, the sense of the original Greek word is more like since rather than if. Since God is for us, who then can be against it? That's a, that's a better understanding. And, and notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't just say, hey, who can be against you? Who can be against us? Uh, because again, uh, we can think of a lot of things and people that can be against it. In fact, later on in this passage, he has these two lists of these things that can be against us uh, in, in this world. There are many potential adversaries in this life. There are many potential things and people that can be against us uh, in this life. But that's not what he says. He doesn't just say who can be against us. He says, if God is for us, God is for us, then who can be against us? And that completely changes the potential answer to that particular question. Uh, imagine uh, the old-fashioned scales, you know, blind justice, 
uh, the scales that they hold where you have the, the two. Does everybody know what I'm talking about here? Okay. Um, well, well just, just picture those types of scales. And on one side of the scale, you start piling up all of those things that can be against you. And you start thinking the scales just keep going down and down and down. And the, and the picture of life becomes bleaker and bleaker and, and bleaker. But then all of a sudden on the other side of the scale, you put God. And all of a sudden everything flips. And, and you recognize, oh, if, if God is for me, uh, the scales uh, are completely different. If God is for me, no one can be uh, against me. But, but the question would be legitimately raised, but how can I know? How can I know that God is for me in that way? And in verse 32, uh, he answers this way, the cross of Jesus Christ is the definitive answer to any doubts about God being for you. If you recognize what, what Jesus has done, what God has done uh, by dying in our place in the cross, it erases, eradicates any doubts that we might have that God is for us. Um, he, he introduces the verse with how. Um, just the, the inconceivable nature of, of the question. No one could possibly be against it. Um, if, if God didn't spare his own son, how could we possibly conceive of any situation where after that, that he would somehow be uh, against us. Um, think of it this way. If, if, if I was willing to give you something of, of the greatest value, how, how could you think that I would be willing to give you something of lesser value? So if I say to John, John, um, I, I'm, I will give you a billion dollars. And John said, oh, thank you. Could you give me a penny? Oh, no, 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 I couldn't do that. Um, there was nothing of greater value that God could give us than his very own son. And Paul is saying here, if, if God would give us the thing that is of greatest value to him, if the father would sacrifice his own son for sinners like you and I, how can we conceive? What situation you could conceive of that he would be unwilling to give you anything lesser uh, than that. And then this important word, how will he not along with him graciously give us all things? Because we can easily say, but I don't deserve it. You're right, you don't. That's not the point. It, 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 he didn't give us his son based on what we deserve. He gave us his son b because of his love. He, he gave us his son contrary to what we deserve. He did it graciously. And he gives us all things. Now, um, some people can falsely teach this prosperity gospel that's no gospel at all. Yeah, that's right. Anything you could possibly want, God would give you. What he means there is he gives us all things that are needful for us. All things that are for our, our, our eternal good. Uh, the Puritan John Flavel, uh, I, I think, wonderfully sums up the reality of this passage this way. How is it imaginable that God should withhold after this, after giving us his son, after this, spirituals or temporals from his people. How shall he not call them effectually, justify them freely, sanctify them thoroughly, and glorify them eternally? How shall he not clothe them, feed them, protect, and deliver them? Surely, if he would not spare his own son one stroke, one tear, one groan, one sigh, one circumstance of misery. It can never be imagined that he should, after this, deny or withhold from his people who forsakes all of this was suffered, any mercies, any comforts, any privilege, spiritual or temporal, which is good for us. So the first thing we should say to these things judicially is, is this, that God didn't spare his own son. How will he not graciously along with him give us all things? There's a second part to his judicial answer we find in verses 33 and 34. 
Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So he begins again with this question, who? And listen, there are certainly many people that are trying to bring charges against us. Uh, The devil, the accuser of the brethren, is constantly trying to bring charges against us. Sometimes other people uh, are bringing charges against us. Our own consciences can at times bring charges against us, can't they? Uh, And our own sins certainly, rightly and justly, at times bring charges uh, against us. But, But God has given us an answer for every one of these potential charges, for every one of these potential accusations, and that is that he justifies, that he declares not guilty, that he declares us to be righteous through our unity with, with, with Jesus, that he declares that our sins are forgiven. He declares that we have a right relationship with him, a right standing with him because of what Jesus has, has done for us. And since it is God who justifies in that way, then who's going to be able to condemn us if God is the one who justifies us in the answer that way? And the answer is no one. There is no one who can overturn the verdict of not guilty, the verdict of righteous, uh, the verdict of right standing that God has declared over us uh, because of Jesus. No one can, can undo that. Uh, we, we live in a land where uh, there are courts and there are higher courts. And, you know, if you lose in one court, then you can appeal to the next court. And if you lose in that court, you can appeal to the next court until you get all the way up to the Supreme Court. And beyond the Supreme Court, there is, there is no appeal. Well, well, God is the Supreme Court. God is the Supreme Judge of the universe. And when he declares, when he makes a judgment, there is no one else to appeal Uh, to. That is it. That is final. God has declared us justified. He has declared us righteous. And we find these wonderful truths in verse 34, that that the grounds of this righteousness isn't simply in in God having some particular um, feeling towards you. The grounds of the righteousness is, is the finished work of Christ. The grounds of this righteousness is that he died a once and for all finished work on our behalf. Uh, It it is the grounds upon which God makes this declaration of not guilty, not condemned. Uh, We find here the the proof uh, of this in the resurrection of Christ, that the resurrection uh, vindicated the acceptance of God uh, for the sacrifice that Jesus has, has made. And then we see the security we have in this justification where he says that Jesus himself sits at the right hand of God interceding for us as a great high priest and as a, uh, as a king. And interceding by his very presence. I, I think a lot of people misunderstand the, this intercession of, of Jesus uh, as, as Jesus simply Uh, sitting at the right hand of God and and praying for us. And I I think it's reasonable to think that Jesus does pray for his church, but that's not what it means. It is the very presence of Jesus crucified and risen, seated at the right hand of God uh, that intercedes, that pleads for us without a word needing to be uh, spoken. You know, sometimes I just have these pictures of how things go. And, and I often have this picture of, of the heavenly throne and God the Father is sitting there and Jesus is sitting at the right hand and the devil or some other person or my conscience or my own sin are just accusing and accusing and accusing. And, and God is just sitting there passively and then at one point he just does this just points to Jesus sitting in his right hand and then the accuser just slinks away because no one can accuse me no one can condemn me if God through Christ has justified me no one can accuse you no one can condemn you oh they can try but no one can succeed 
Because Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father and by his very presence, by his wounds, is, is interceding for you hour by hour, moment by moment, day by day. So we see these two wonderful relational answers to the questions, what shall we say to these things? Uh, what shall we say to these things? How can we possibly conceive that God who didn't spare his own son would somehow uh, refuse to give us anything that was needful? And who do, who do we think could condemn us if God himself uh, has justified us as the supreme judge of uh, the universe. And in those things, uh, we have a rock, we have a security. But he doesn't just leave us with a judicial answer. He goes on to give a, a relational answer. Uh, despite some of the, agreement, the disagreements we would have with his theology, uh, many people consider Karl Barth, the German, to be the preeminent theologian of the 20th century. And uh, at one point, uh, Barth was giving a lecture at a college, and students were waiting around out front, and, and as he walked in to the lecture, one of the students cried out, uh, Dr. Barth, Dr. Barth, what is the most important truth in the Bible? And this, this great mind, this great theologian, turned to the student and simply said this, quote from a children's song, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. What did the greatest, what many consider the greatest theologian uh, think was the greatest truth of Scripture? Simply that Jesus loves you and, and that the Bible tells us of the reality of that. Um, you know, often when we speak about relationships in a broken world, we can say something came between them. We see perhaps a divorce or a friendship that was that was broken, or, or brothers and sisters or family that's turned against one another, and, and, and we see that that relationship is broken, and, and we can easily say, well, just something came between them. So can anything come between us and Jesus? Can anything come between us and the love of God the Father? Can anything break that relationship well, that's what uh, Paul addresses in verses 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written? For your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No! In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, he begins, who, who shall? And there's a, a lot of possibilities uh, that we could consider when we're uh, asking that, uh, that question. You know, one of the great temptations that all of us face in, in times of, of trials and suffering, particularly long suffering, is where's God? Has he abandoned me? Does he care? You, you, you read the Psalms, and, and that's the, the, the frequent question uh, of the psalmist, where are you? Have you turned your face from me? His prayers, don't hide your face from me. Where are you, God, in the midst of, of struggling? Have you abandoned me in the midst of struggle? Has something come between us? And is that the reason that I'm experiencing uh, these trials and sufferings and, and, and shaking? And again, uh, like I said earlier, as human beings, we have a, a unique ability to say, what if? And Paul actually brings some of those things. What, what if tribulation? Uh, what if distress or hardship? What if persecution? What if some kind of deprivation? You mentioned famine or nakedness, but we could say sickness or, or, or a loss of a job or financial troubles we could add. What if there's some danger? Uh, what if some sword, actual physical threat? And then, I think interesting, he quotes from Psalm 44 too, in a way that I think, I don't think that is helpful, Paul. Uh, 
He says, for your sake, we're being killed all day long. I think, whoa, whoa, I, you know, was that really necessary? But what he's trying to do is point us to the fact suffering has always been the lot of the godly. Uh, we can't think that something unusual is happening to us uh, when we suffer. Suffering has always been the lot of the godly. But after listing all of these possibilities, Paul answers the question with, with this resounding no. No. There isn't anything that shall separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That we are more than conquerors over all of those uh, things. Now, you've you got to understand, the, the emphasis here isn't on the greatness uh, of the victory or even the completeness of the victory, and certainly not on the immediacy of the victory. Um, uh, again, remember what we, we said earlier, we groan until the redemption of our bodies. We live in a fallen world until the redemption of our bodies. Um, so we, we don't need to grimly march through life just, just waiting for death because now we are actually more than conquerors because of him who loved us. And, and the, the things from the world's perspective, when they see Christians suffer or persecuted or, 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 or be sick or, or experience some tragedy, from the world's perspectives would look like defeats. Um, Paul is saying here from an eternal perspective, they are, they are victories. Uh, the, the, that, that they're just another step towards, towards that conquest. Um, not because we're mighty as conquerors, but through him who loved us. And then I love how Paul begins verses 38 and 39, for I am sure. When you read Paul's sufferings in scripture and all the things that he went through and you think, oh, he had to have been tempted at times to say what if and, and wonder uh, like the psalmist did. But because of these truths he's, he, he's speaking here, he can say, I am sure. I am sure um, that things are, 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 are going to be well. He has no doubts whatsoever. And his conviction is able to say, his ability to say, I am sure, is based on the very same things that we now today can, can say, I am sure uh, because of. And so he lists again these things that might oppose. He says, I am sure that neither death nor life, that nothing in this life that we might face, or even death itself, uh, the great fear, uh, the, 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 the great enemy, uh, the, can't triumph over the, uh, over the love of, uh, of Christ. Um, death, the root word for death means separation. And, and death is the greatest of all separators uh, in life. Um, but even death, uh, rather than separating us from this world, uh, it's just the means to unite us to Jesus for all of eternity. So neither death nor life, neither angels or rulers, in other words, no spiritual being, and we are in a spiritual battle, uh, things present or things to come, you know, the things that are going on right now, but the things in the future that tend to be the things that we anxious and worry about what's going to happen to me in the future, not things present or things to come, not powers. Uh, this is a really interesting word. It, it means uh, astrological powers. That in those days, many people think, my, my life is, is just controlled by fate or by chance, these, these impersonal powers. Um, in, in our day, uh, we might say evolutionary change, that, that uh, if evolution is really true, uh, then there's no plan, there's no purpose, there's nothing moving things along. Um, why did this person get sick? Why did this terrible thing happen? It's, it's just, who knows, it's just chance, it's just fate. And, and, and so Paul is saying today, no, your, your, your life is not ruled by chance or faith. It's ruled by God himself, a sovereign God over all of these things. So not powers, nor height, nor depth. Uh, he's just referring to everything that creation is made of, space and time, that none of those things. And then again, I, I love it that he says, nor anything else of all of creation. Again, just recognizing it was, oh, well, Paul, you didn't say this, you didn't say this, you didn't think about this. 
Uh, just in case there's a yeah, but about to come in your own heart or your own thoughts, Paul says, hold on, or anything else in all creation. Let's rule out everything. Let's even rule out ourselves. Because if God foreknowed and, and, and chose you to be saved, um, you, you can't blow it. Uh, he's he's going to maintain your salvation to the end. So you can't even mess up God's eternal plan for you uh, as much as sometimes we might try to do so. No, nothing, nothing will be able to separate us in this life or in the life to come from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Let me just read you a couple quotes and then... Uh, I'm going to close by uh, looking back at the first question. John Stott said this, Our confidence is not in our love for him, which is frail, fickle, and faltering, but in his love for us, which is steadfast, faithful, and persevering. That's why Paul could say, I am sure. J. Sidler Baxter said this, Underneath all our seemingly big and comparatively tiny burden of care are the strong arms and the tender upholding of an infinite wisdom, an infinite power, and an infinite love, which will never let us down, will never give us up, and will never let us go. So let's just close by going back where we started. Paul starts with saying, what shall we say to these things? He's speaking to the church corporately. What is to be the corporate testimony of the church in regards to these things that he spoke of? But my challenge, my question for you today is simply this. What shall I say to these things? What shall you say to these things in the midst of a of a shaky world. Oh, beloved, I, I, I pray that you would say, uh, along with Paul, if God did not spare his own son, how will he not also along with him graciously give me all things? If God is the one who justifies as the supreme judge of the universe, who is it that could possibly condemn me? And there is nothing in all of creation that can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And oh, beloved, it is, it is those realities that, that are the rock that enables us in a shaky world and shaky times and difficult things uh, to be able to stand unshaken in the realities of God's justification and God's love for us. So Father, I, I do pray, I pray that you would grant each and every one of us in the midst of difficult trials now and in the days to come to remember these realities, these promises grounded in the glorious gospel of what Jesus has done, what God has done to save us from our sins and to keep us till the end. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.